let's um, let's get into it. I think we're pretty much all here. All right, so we're going to get straight into it, guys. Um, the triangle of light um, is made up of three components. All right, so we've got aperture, as you can see on the left. We've got ISO, and we've got shutter speed. All right, so. Um, this basically just sort of gives you an idea of the different effects, but I'm going to showcase that for you um, in a few images. All right, so let's um, let's get into this straight away. Okay, so I just want to try and get this like that. All right, so what mode should you be using when it comes to um, wildlife photography? Sorry, I'm just having... Okay. All right, so these are the different modes. You've got auto on your camera, um, you've got program, you've got aperture priority that's uh, marked as AV or A on your, um, on your camera. Then you've got shutter priority, which is uh, marked as TV or S, and then manual, which is uh, marked as M on your camera. So this just gives you an idea of what you can control in this particular mode. So I'm not going to worry about auto and program. I'm hoping that you guys are not using any of those two modes. And um, the two that I mainly use is aperture priority and shutter um, and, and manual mode. Shutter priority, I don't use that much purely because you can see your camera is in charge of your aperture. And aperture is actually one of your most creative tools when it comes to wildlife photography. And I'm going to be sharing that um, with you as to why that is. So um, these modes I'm only talking about then be aperture priority and manual mode. All right, so, all right, so shutter speed. What is shutter speed? So the easiest way that I can um, explain it to you guys is to think of it as opening and closing your eyes. All right, so if your camera says 125th of a second, it means that when you press that shutter, your shutter opens and closes in 125th of a second, okay? So think about it this way. If you're using, let's go to auto mode, right? If you, if you use auto mode, you'll find when you go into a dark place, your camera will go, right? So it'll be very slow. Often then you'll find the image will be out of focus or blurred. So think of it as our eyes. If you walk into a dark room, your eyes need to stay open for longer to be able to capture an image, right? If it's in a light area, like if you go outside midday, you can open and close your eyes very quickly and you'll be able to see what's in front of you. Okay, so that's basically what shutter speed is. It's the opening and closing of your shutter when you push that button. Now, as, um, as a rule of third, we say that your shutter speed should be equivalent to your focal length. So what that means, if you've got a 400 millimeter lens, your shutter speed technically should not be below one over 400. I'm gonna show you now what it looks like on your camera. One over 400. And what that does, it basically, it eliminates any of that camera shake that you might have. As much as we'd like to think we don't have camera shake, each of us do. So that one over 400th of a second will mean that it will, Eliminate any camera shake, so it won't it won't uh, blur your photo. But that's mainly for stationary subjects. Okay, so you your aim, like probably about ninety five percent of the time, will be to freeze a particular moment. Okay, so if a lion is walking or a leopard is running, you want to freeze that moment. You want to capture those legs in the air and not have any movement, any blur there. So you need a fast shutter speed. So that's what, what I personally, every time I get to a particular scene, and it, it's different for each and every person. When you get to a particular scene that you want to photograph, the first thing that you've got to think to yourself is, do I want to freeze this moment or do I, do I want to blur this moment? Like I said, majority of the time we want to freeze that moment. Um, we want to like, get the legs in the air or the bird flying. We want to have a fast shutter speed. Okay, so like I said, one over focal length, and that's how it appears on your on your camera. So one over two hundred or fifty or four hundred, whatever it may be. So as a guideline, most of the time you won't go wrong if if you stick to this 
a guideline. If you have a 500 mm lens, your shutter speed shouldn't drop below one over 500. If you have a 600 mm lens, the same thing. Um, so naturally, if you have a wider angle lens, you can shoot at a slower shutter speed if you are photographing stationary subjects. Okay. I'm going to show you guys a few examples. So that's where, if you look at your camera, and it's, it's, this is a Canon camera, it's, most of it is the same on, on any camera. It will show, like your shutter speed will be at the left. If you look through the viewfinder, it's usually at the bottom left of your frame. Now, if you're shooting an aperture priority in AV or in A mode, you will see if you pick your camera up, I don't know if you guys have a camera with you, but pick it up and you'll see if you point it towards a very bright part of the, um, like maybe um, the sky, you'll see your shutter speed will be very fast. If you bring it down to a darker area, you see your shutter speed will become slower. And that's because, remember I said with your eyes, it needs to stay open a little bit longer to be able to capture that information. But there's ways we can manipulate that and I'll get to that a little bit later on. So again, if you look at, <clears throat> if you look at the back of your camera, top left, that's your shutter speed, one over 200, okay? So in this particular case, if I was shooting at a 400 more lens and I shoot at 200 of a second, very likely that photo will be blurred, will be out of focus because my shutter speed is too slow and you've got a bit of that camera shake. Same thing if an animal is running or animals uh, or birds flying, if you're shooting at one over 200, there's a very good chance that, that there might be some blur or um, some movement in that frame. I'm going to show you, be showing you guys a few examples here. So here's um, a big male lion that was running towards us and there were a few vultures behind us that were trying to get to the carcass. See my shutter speed at the bottom right here? 1,250th of a second. So it, meant, it would mean when I press my shutter down, that shutter open and close in 1,250th of a second. So it's very fast. You see that um, the, the hair is, is um, everything is frozen. The leg is frozen. The one leg is in the air. That's frozen. There's no movement in there. Okay, so, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Anything over a thousandth of a second, that's very fast. That's going to freeze most, um, most movements. Okay. Again, hippos fighting. The biggest thing for me here is, I wanted to get a fast shutter speed. Hippos fighting, they were going up and down. and There's a lot of action, a lot of movement going on. If you have a fast shutter speed, you will freeze that movement. So again, have a look through your viewfinder. You'll see what your shutter speed is. I'll, I'll tell you now how you can manipulate it. That comes um, later on in the, in the webinar. But a fast shutter speed, you get these kind of results. Action froze, um, frozen. There's no movement around the face, the mouth, anywhere there. Okay. Again, like birds flying. Oh, I've got my face in the way, but this is at 2,500th of a second. You can see there's even, even then, even at that speed, there's a bit of movement on those wings. So maybe, yeah, if I went the faster shutter speed, like 3,200, 4,000th of a second even, that would freeze some of that movement as well. Okay. Again, I miss the Masamara so much. I had to put a few photos in of the, of the migration and river crossings. The river crossings, if you guys have seen it, um, it happens very quickly. The animals jumping in, running in. So a far shutter speed is needed. Again, with this, like that, um, one of the first photos I showed you, that uh, example, if my shutter speed here was at 200th of a second, then it, that wildebeest the would have been, there would have been a bit of movement. There would have been a bit of blur in the image, which I don't want. I want to freeze that action. You can even see the water droplets. Everything is frozen. And that's because I got that fast shutter speed. Again, another wildebeest jumping. You can see a thousandth of a second freezes that um, sort of movement, the legs in the air, um, and a bit of water you can see on the bottom right of the frame. So very, very fast shutter speed. Um, again, you know, for something like this, um, you want to have a fast shutter speed. You can get creative and then go very slow. So that's what happens when you go very slow shutter speed. Here you can see intentionally I moved. So th this is at one eighth of a second. So very, very slow. I was shooting with a, um, with a 400 millimeter lens. 
So way down from that one over focal length range. But this is when you want to start getting a little bit creative. And how you do, how you get these kinds of shots is you move with the animal. So very slow shutter speed, even anything from about a 15th or a 20th of a second with movement like this. You focus on your animals, keep your shutter in, so you take continuous photos and you move with the animal. You start getting um, results like this. I see your questions there. Thank you very much. Once we're done with the shutter speed section, I'll answer some of the questions that you guys might have um, on shutter speed. So you can use it as a very creative tool as well. Again, here's a lion running. So intentionally, I went with a shutter speed of one tenth of a second to try and get that sort of that panning um, movement. So again, you focus on him, keep taking photos while you move at the same speed as him. And the idea behind this is to then get his face or the body in focus and that sort of the legs moving. If I wanted to get him sharp and in focus and, and, and freeze everything, again, I needed to get that fast shutter speed, about 800 or a thousandth of a second to, to freeze that, uh, that, that movement. But remember, and this is something that I try and get people to practice every time when we're out in the field is, you know, how many images of lions can you take walking or running? Right? There, there comes a stage where you've, you've done it so many times, why carry on doing the same thing again? You know, start challenging yourself from a photographic point of view. A lot of the time people are saying they're getting bored of their photography. That's purely because people are not willing to take that risk of trying something like this. Okay, so this is a slow shutter speed, that panning movement, moving with the animal. Again, a rhino. So if you think of a rhino, it moves much slower than a lion, right? So here my shutter speed has gone even slower, one sixth of a second. And luckily a rhino is quite a big animal. So you can focus on the head or the shoulders, move at the same speed as them and, and keep, uh, keep taking photos. And then remember when, you, when you're doing something like this, not, not every single photo will work. You'll find if you move a little bit up and down, these sort of um, vertical lines will become horizontal as well. So you want to sort of, if you have a beanbag, you can keep it dead steady. So you don't move up and down and you just move at the same speed as your subject. All right, so that's when you want to get really creative. I just wanted to sort of give you guys an idea sort of the differences with the shutter speed and the different effects you can get. Again, nice leopard um, at a fifth of a second. So you can even see that movement of the tail. Sorry, you got my face in the way as well. <laughs> um, but you can see that that's what you want to try and achieve. You want to get that, that head in focus. And because that animal is moving, because your shutter speed is so slow, remember now at a fifth of a second, it's opening, staying open a little bit longer and then closing. So while your shutter is staying open, any movement that's there is going to get captured, right? If it was at a thousandth of a second, it will open and close very quickly. That movement won't show, it will freeze everything. I hope that makes sense. Again, nice elephant, probably one of, the, for me, one of the hardest animals to photograph, just to try and sort of make them um, look pretty or get creative with them. If they're running, especially to, towards water holes, great time to, um, to pan them. Slow shutter speed, you can see, again, a sixth of a second. And when you're doing the, the, this panning stuff, I found for me personally, the slower you go, the higher the risk that the whole thing might be, uh, might be blurred, but the rewards are also great. If you had to shoot this maybe at a 50th of a second, you won't really get as much blur and it will look like sort of half this, half that, if that makes sense. So either freeze it, so go like a thousandth of a second, or bring it slow, like anything from about a 20th of a second up to about a fifth of a second, you know, get some amazing results. And then if you're shooting the night sky, right? So this is in, in manual mode, then you can put your shutter open for like 30 seconds. So stand still for 30 seconds. And um, you can see there's a bit of a torch on, on the people and then you'll get that beautiful um, Milky Way. I know Andrew Dankwoods did um, a webinar a little while ago about shooting the night sky. So go check it out. It is on YouTube um, where he shares more um, on photographing the Milky Way. <coughs> okay. So that is, that is everything from 
um, a shutter speed point of view. I just want to see um, what questions we have here. If you guys have any questions um, about shutter speed, please uh, fire them away now. Um, so Ada says, I have a Canon, but when I am in AV mode, I can't see the shutter speed info. Do you know why? Um, Ada, just try and half pressure or shutter. Uh, if you half pressure or shutter, the information should come on. The reason it doesn't show is because it will change the whole time. So half pressure or shutter, so point towards the sky, half pressure or shutter, and then we'll, it will show up. And then you can let go. And if you move around a little bit, it might stay there for a little while and then disappear. And it's just half pressure or shutter again. Um, I don't know if you have your camera with you, then uh, let me know if that helps. Uh, but that usually does a trick. Just half pressure or shutter and it will come up. Um, so Sally asked, if I'm in, shooting an aperture priority, how do I change my shutter speed without changing my aperture? Do I have to change the ISO? Yes. Short answer, yes. But we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But yeah, short answer, aperture and ISO, yeah, that does change your, your shutter speed. Uh, just see what other questions we have here. Uh, oh. trying to get to, can't find my mouse for some reason. Uh, sorry guys, I'm just trying to locate my mouse in this thing. I think I might have found it. See, there's two more questions. Let's just see here. Um, okay, Ida says she can see it now. That's perfect. Um, that's great. Thanks, Ida. That, that, I'm glad that, that helps. So, and have a look now. You'll see when you move it around, point it at a dark area, you'll see your, um, the shutter number will go down. And as soon as you point to a bright area, that number will go up again. All right, so that's cool. We've got, we've got that sorted. Okay. Um, okay, let's... Let me try and, okay, let's let's go into. So I don't know why I can't find my mouse. That's very very strange. Okay, aperture priority or uh, aperture as a, as a whole. How do we explain that? So that is basically um, think of it as the iris of like of your eye. So and this aperture takes place. In your lens, it doesn't take place in your camera, right? Um, so this is gonna it'll take me a little bit. So that that takes place in your in your lens. So a lot of the time, you'll find people say, "I can go down to 2.8," and you might try on your camera, but you can't get down to 2.8, and that's that's all in the lens. So you see, when you when you buy a lens. You see, you get a like, let's take a 400 more lens, for example, you get a 100 to 400 millimeter lens, which goes down to 4.5 at 100 moles, and then at 5.6 at, um, at 400 moles. Then you also get a 400 mole fixed, 2.8. Now, there's a massive difference in price, and there's, um, there's a very, very good reason for that. And that's because of that, um, that shallow depth of field that you can create in your aperture. So that's basically what aperture does is it affects your depth of field of your, of your image. So what I would then again do when I get to a scene, first thing I think about, do I want to freeze this particular moment or do I want to blur it? So that comes under your shutter speed, right? So once you've decided, okay, great, I've got my, um, got my fast shutter speed. Now I think what depth of field do I want to create? And what depth of field is, is if you've got a particular subject, uh, a lion or an elephant, do you want to blur that background out or do you want to include more of that background? Now, if you, uh, I hope you guys can see this little graph at the bottom, the 1.42, 2.8, F4. I hope you guys can all see that. The way I see it is the white parts that you can see in the 1.42, 2.8. The white parts, that's the amount of light that's coming into your lens, right? 
So that's going to give you a faster shutter speed. The black areas is your depth of field. That's not what I'm saying. It is, yep, that's how I remember it. Because a lot of the time people will say um, a large aperture, but it's a small number. So it all gets very confusing. So I'm going to keep it very simple. The white areas and the graph at the bottom is the amount of light coming in. The black areas is your depth of field. So you can see um, at f1.4 and f2, a lot of light's coming through, but it's, um, it's very, uh, very sort of shallow depth of field. And I often compare it to sort of squinting your eyes. So I think of your aperture, the smaller the number, the smaller your eyes. So if you go down at 2.8, you'll find you've got a very small part of it will be in focus. The back will be blown, uh, blurred out. If you, go, if you open your eyes bigger, so a higher F number, you'll find more of it will be in focus. Yeah, makes sense. I hope that makes sense. I'm going to try and um, show you guys a few examples as well. Okay, so let's get through here. Um, okay, so what is it and why would I use it? So first of all, to like I mentioned, to isolate your subject from the background, that is vital. That's one of your most creative tools when it comes to wildlife photography. The second one is maybe to include more depth of field. So if you maybe if you've got a beautiful scenery, beautiful mountain, you want to include more of that. And then the third one is to have multiple subjects that are in focus. So that's what your depth of field does, your aperture does, right? And that will show, if you look at um, through your viewfinder, it will usually be in the middle, your F number. And usually with, the, if you're in AV mode or A mode, the top dial um, with your index finger, if you dial that to the left, the number will go down. If you dial it to the right, the number will go up. Okay. I'm going to show, I'll still tell you guys how it all comes together. Don't worry too much about that. Okay, sorry. I see there's, uh, there's questions again. I'll, uh, I'll get to them as soon as we're done with, um, with the aperture part of it. Okay, so um, I hope you guys can see, all see this, this graph down at the bottom here. So you can see at, uh, at F2.8, how oh, that, oh, sorry. At F2.8, if you focus on your, on your subject, you'll see the foreground will, um, will get blurred as well as the background. So it's a very important when you're shooting at these shallow depths of field, the low apertures, that your focal point is bang on. Otherwise, you're gonna be out of focus. So if you shoot at 2.8 or even lower, it's very, very, um, very, very um, high risk almost. You've got to be bang on with your focal point. Whereas if you include a little bit more depth of field, F7, F8, F9, you'll see your depth of field becomes more. Also gives you a little bit more room for error. Okay. I hope that makes sense so far. But there's also, there's a few things that, um, that influences your, your depth of field. So how far your subject is from you, that plays a role with depth of field. So think of it as um, if, if you take your hand in front of you, right? And you take, make a small sort of hole. If you go very close to your hand, you'll find the middle of your hand will be in focus, but the points here will be out of focus. Right? If I move that further away, try and line this up, more of my hand will be in focus. Does that make sense? So it's the same thing with your subject. If your subject comes a little bit closer to you, you need to increase your depth of field to get more of its face in focus. If your subject is a few hundred meters away, for sure you can shoot at 2.8. Because it's that far away, your depth of field is shallow, but it will still get the most of the body in focus. Okay, hope, uh, hope that makes sense. Also your distance from your background. So if I'm here, the wall is very close, even with a shallow depth of field, if you go 2.8 to my face, there's probably very little chance to be able to blur this wall out behind me because it's so close. If it's a little bit further away, that depth of field gets enhanced uh, even more. And then your focal length. So if you're shooting with a zoom lens, 100 to 400, 
if you're shooting, let's say f4 or 5.6 at 100 mils, probably not that much depth of like uh, shallow depth of field. If you go in really close at a 400 mil range, that depth of field gets enhanced a bit more. It'll be shallower your depth of field. So that's something to to keep in mind. Yeah, I see your your guys' questions there. That's great. I'm going to get to them once we through this. Uh, this aperture section. So here you can see male leopard. Remember, I, I put the lens here for a reason because remember the closer you get, the more that depth of field gets enhanced. And the reason for this, why I shot it at f4, is to try and blur those, those, that uh, tall grass in the background. Remember, when you're photographing, especially wildlife, you've got to often deal with a lot of distracting elements. And by choosing a shallow depth of field, you'll see most of his face is still in focus. If you have a look at, the, at his, uh, where his neck goes down onto his back, you'll see that starts then um, to get soft and out of focus. That sort of, it almost makes the animal pop out a bit more. Whereas if I shot here at like maybe F8, F9, I would have had more of that background and focus, which meant more grass for my viewers' eyes to look at. So it's, it's something to sort of keep in mind, especially when you're photographing wildlife. I'll show you a few examples when you want to go and add a little bit more depth of field. Okay, this is with the uh, 300 more lens. And look how shallow my depth of field is. It's at 3.2, F3.2. It's a very, very shallow depth of field. But because those elephants are so far away from me, that whole elephant is still in focus, but the mountain in the back, because the mountain is so far away, the mountain in the back is, is out of focus. In this particular case, if I added more depth of field, if I went F9, F10, F11, I would have had that mountain in focus, which I didn't really want. I wanted that elephant just to, uh, to stand out a bit more. Okay, beautiful male lion um, in the Goro Goro crater. That was actually um, a couple of months ago. Again, 600 more lens at F4, and you see how beautiful and soft that green background is. Um, if you, uh, if you had to include more depth of field in this particular case, then that background would obviously become a possible distracting element, again, which you don't want. So especially with that, uh, with that 600 more lens, I love shooting at F4. It, it really is very, very pretty. It gives that soft bouquet to your images. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, I see your guys' questions there. That's great. I'll come back to them. Okay, a 400 millimeter lens at f4. So, uh, fantastic moment. Um, the lioness with her with a little cub. And sorry, guys, I'm still just having issues with this mouse. I just want to, aha, uh -huh, there we go. Got one out. There we go. Um, Lioness here with, with a little cap, very, very tiny cap, maybe like a few hours old. I wanted to, again, blur that background out, make the focus on her. And you can see I was shooting at F4, focus, and this is, again, this is where it's key, where you put your focus point. Even the, the difference between putting a focus point on her ear or on her eye will make a massive difference in your image because you're shooting in that shallow depth of field. I was also zoomed in all the way at 400 millimeters. So that depth of field gets enhanced so much more. Have a look at how soft that background is. Again, I didn't want my viewers' eyes to, um, to wander away from this, uh, this lioness. You can see the grass in the foreground to the left. That is in focus. But then everything behind her is out of focus. Again, also because it's quite far away from her. Okay. Elephant coming really, really close to you. Again, now your focal point becomes key. Have a look at the trunk and the ears. See how that's out of focus. So it becomes critical in how you sort of, what image or what story you want to tell. If in this particular case, I wanted the entire elephant's uh, face in focus, then I would have had to go maybe at F10, F11, because he was so close. If he was further away, could have had more in focus at F4.5. Okay, so something to keep in mind when an animal comes closer to you, to increase that depth of field. Again, male lion, really, really close. You see now I've put a little bit more depth into my image at 7.1. You can see now the eye on the, if you're looking at the frame, the eye on the left, 
that's got a little bit more focus than the one on the right. Okay. So probably in hindsight, I should have maybe gone to maybe F9, F10, but because it's so close, again, if it was a little bit further away, you would have gotten away with that. If I shot you at like 2.8 or even lower, then maybe just that one part will be in focus. Or even, uh, I don't know if you've seen those images, if he lifted his head up a little bit, if I focused on the nose, the nose would have been sharp with those eyes out of focus or other way around. So it becomes critical where you put your focal point um, if you're going to shoot that shallow depth of field. It's a great way to tell stories. And this is one of the reasons why I love shooting in aperture priority. It's because if, you shoot, if you're shooting in shutter priority, which is TV or S, yes, you get a fast shutter speed, which is great, but your camera chooses the depth of field for you. So how does your camera know what you want in focus and what you don't? So I prefer shooting aperture priority. I'll tell you um, a little bit later on how um, I manage my shutter speed, but this gives me great um, ways to sort of tell a different story by playing with my, my depth of field. Again, with this, focus on the buffalo. Um, you could have focused on the, uh, on the line as well. It gives you two different, different fields. But because, again, F9, you can see this beautiful depth all the way to those um, the buffalo in the front and the wildebeest at the back. Okay. Then, um, you know, in a scene like this, vital that you have uh, depth across your frame. Um, you know, if I shot this at like 2.8, I would have had either the giraffes or the wild dogs in focus. I wanted to tell the story with all of them together in focus, and that's why F8, you can even have gone maybe F9 or something like that, just to, um, to increase a bit of depth of field. Okay, 140 mils uh, at F9, beautiful depth you see all the way across um, the open plains of the Serengeti. Um, so I'm hoping this is starts, to, starts to make a little bit more sense. Again, lioness. I was quite close at a 400 millimeter lens with the cubs, 7.1 just to get depth across them, but it also still blurs out that background. If I shot this maybe at like 2.8, I would have had maybe just one of the lionesses in focus, but not the cubs, which I want. You know, I want that whole story of all of them together. So that's what you have to sort of think about. First of all, fast shutter speed, and then what you want to do with your uh, depth of field. Okay. I do miss the Mara a lot, <laughs> as you guys can probably tell. Again, F10, lots going on. Um, zebra's going down, wildebeest going down, some in the water, some going down, some at the top. So by including, de including depth of field, it just showcases more of the story. Again, if I went with this at like 2.8, if I focused on the, the wildebeest in the water, then the ones in the back or the ones coming down wouldn't be in focus. Okay, so it's about the story that you want to tell. Okay, so that's, um, that's Aperture. I'm gonna quickly uh, see what, uh, what questions we, we have. Let's have a look at the questions quickly. Um, so there's quite a few here and have a look. Brennan asked, uh, is there any way to create shallow depth of field with two subjects in focus with the soft background? when the subject themselves are not close to each other in the foreground, um, as if you split your focus point. Uh, Brendan, you can do that. Um, it's a way that you can sort of uh, stitch your photos together. So in Photoshop, you can take two photos together and then stitch them, um, two separate photos and then stitch them together. In a particular scene, it's very difficult. So you have to go for one or the other um, to be able to get them, um, sort of to get that, uh, blurred background. Otherwise, um, go in close, so include very little of the background and then just shoot with a with, with more depth of field. So shoot maybe F9, F10. I hope that that helps a little bit. Um, Shazmin, hi, Shazmin. For action shots, do you open up the aperture to so help not missing the movement or not? Great question, Shazmin. Um, so in a in a particular scene, so what, what Shazmin is saying, like if you have a lion chasing a zebra, do I shoot at 2.8 to get that fast shutter speed? The problem is then is if you, you you're, like remember I said, the, your room for error becomes very small. So I prefer to like shoot a little bit more depth of field, like F7.1 or so, and then check what shutter speed I get at that particular moment. If my shutter speed is then still too slow, i.e. 
less than a thousand at least for an action shot, then I'm going to bring in this next guy, ISO. Okay, Jasmine, I hope that makes sense. I'm going to come to questions again once uh, I think once I bring in um, this ISO and how we combine it together, I think it's going to make more sense. Um, Ida, in your Ida asked in your panoramic pics you did of the lions in a tree and Ellie's walking down. Were you in high aperture as the whole scene was in focus? Ada, <clears throat> um, yes, I was shooting that at like um, f7.1 or f8, I think. But um, still, my focus point was on the on the lioness. So I focused on the lioness once, and then took a few shots around it. So I didn't focus every single time. If that makes sense. So my focus was still on the on the lioness. Uh, took a few shots, but yeah, f8, f9, exactly because of that to try and get all of them in focus. Uh, Shazman asks, do you ever just leave your aperture at f7.1 or is it important to keep changing it depending on what you want in focus? Is there an aperture you can leave to be safe? Shazman, 7.1, not, not much is going to go wrong. 7.1 is, is a good bet. I do like like those some of those images I showed you with that 600 mm. I love taking down to f4. You really get that, those smooth backgrounds. If you want to play it safe, yes, yeah, seven point one. Not much is going to go wrong with that. Okay, but you know, again, it all just depends. You know, if, if there's a big herd of elephants and they come really, really close to you, then you might you have to um, increase it a bit more. Okay, I hope that that helps. That's all the questions I see for aperture. I'm going to move on to to Shutter's Beach just to just to keep it moving, um, and then at the end, you know, there'll be opportunity for, for more questions again. Um, so ISO, <laughs> our good friend ISO. Guys, this is probably the thing I think people um, people think about or overthink the most when it comes to, to wildlife photography. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna try and, there we go. <clears throat> what it basically is, so back in the film, uh, film days, right, you had different films like 200 or 400, whatever it may be. Now with digital cameras, all ISO is, is your camera's sensitivity to light. That's it. That's all it is. People overthink it so much. You know, a lot of the times, I get it so many times when you're out in the field, people say, what should my ISO be? It, it doesn't really matter what your ISO is. It all depends what shutter speed you have and what aperture you have. I'm going to show you guys a few examples of that now. The only downside with ISO is once you go higher with your ISO, you start getting a bit of grain, a bit of noise. Um, I'm going to show you guys what that looks like. So that's basically, you start seeing these little grains in your images, right? And you start getting pixels. Now, with, the, with software, with things like Lightroom and Photoshop, you can get rid of this to a degree, but and th there's, a, there's an example for you. So 100 ISO, you see the image is nice and smooth. Once you go up to 5,000, again, this is very much camera dependent, you start getting a bit of grain. Now, naturally, your um, cameras with the smaller sensors, so your 1.4 crops or two times crop, um, they sort of have more pixels in there, so they show a noise a lot more. Whereas your full frame cameras, they tend to show noise a lot less. The, the cameras definitely have improved with this. I remember when I had a 1D Mark II, um, like quite a while ago, and you know that would go to ISO like 800 and will start start showing a bit of grain. Now, I just want to uh, link this up for you guys, just so you can show it a bit better connected this to my phone just to, to give you guys a bit of a better idea of what these images look like. I hope it, hope it goes up. Okay, it should show, yeah, there we go. It, it goes up. So this, this gives you quite a, quite a cool idea. So if you look at uh, on the left hand side, at 100 and then 800 you start getting a bit of noise 1600 and then look at 3200 you start getting a bit sort of more pixels but guys this is really you know there, there comes a stage where you have to if you have that 
leopard hunting uh, an impala or a, a leopard carrying a pangolin in its mouth, whatever it may be. It's either you're going to have a bit of grain in your image or you're going to have a shutter speed that is too slow. So, right, so grain, like I said, grain you can work with. Grain you can, there's great noise reduction tools. I think Jerry did, um, did a webinar on that. There's great ways you can get rid of some of that noise, but if an image is blurred, there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, so, and also, you know, a lot of the time I ask people, what do you do with your images? Do you print them big? Like, no, no, you post them on Instagram. You view Instagram on your, on your phone, right? So you're not really going to see grain when it comes to, uh, when it comes to showcasing images on, on, uh, on Instagram or on your phone. Also, if you're printing photos, if you're printing photos on a big canvas um, print, canvas actually, noise actually works quite well on canvas sometimes. Okay, so here's a, a few scenarios. I'm going to show you guys ISO 4000. And the reason why I went to 4000 is as my ISO goes up, my shutter speed also goes up. Okay, so if you, if you have a look, if you've got your camera in front of you, point at something in particular, put your ISO on 100, and you'll see what your shutter speed is, and then put your ISO, push it up to like 6,400, and you'll see what happens. So, like I said, there comes a time, especially, so that's, that's the image. Like from there, that, that's going to be the image that I post, right? If you zoom in really close, yes, you can see the pixels and things, but I'm not going to post that. I'm not going to zoom in that close on my image anyway. So a lot of the time people zoom in at a thousand percent and they say, oh, but there's grain. But you know, that's not the way you're going to showcase your image. Zoom in out and it's actually, it's very workable. Okay. Often at night, you can see ISO up to 5,000. It's either I put my ISO up to 5,000, so my shutter speed becomes faster, or I don't get any image at all. It's going to be blurred because my shutter speed is too slow. Okay. Again, that's going to be the image that I post. If I go really close, yes, for sure, there's grain, no doubt about it. But for posting on Instagram or even on a canvas print, that will do no problem at all. Okay. Again, ISO 4000 because it's such a beautiful scene. Two beautiful leopard cubs. Yes, the light was low, but if you don't push that ISO up, any movement that those cubs might uh, do, jumping and running, which they do quite a lot of, is going to be out of focus. Okay, so guys, don't really don't overthink ISO at all. ISO should be your last tool. Again, 3,200 ISO. Because the reason for this being is now remember, first of all, I wanted fast shutter speed. Tick. Okay. Now with this, I don't want to shoot this at 2.8. Yes, 2.8 will give me more light, a faster shutter speed, but I, I want both of these animals in focus. So I go up to increase my depth of field to about 5.6, 6.3. And then I see, oh, my shutter speed has dropped down again because the more depth of field you include, the slower your shutter speed becomes. So my ISO has to fit in with whatever I want in my frame. Makes sense. Okay, so I wanted a fast shutter speed, I wanted depth, so I put my ISO to whatever it needs to be. If I had to go up to 6,000 ISO, I would have done that because, again, it's either that or missing out on an amazing moment. Okay, now let's combine all those three together. All right, so I put the settings down for you at the bottom. So, what are the first, what's the first thing that if you get this particular scene in front of you, first thing is, you need a fast shutter speed, right? Because the zebra's moving, they're jumping, right? The second thing is I want a bit of depth of field in them to get the whole bodies in focus. So I don't just want the heads in focus. Remember, if I shot this at 2.8, yes, great. It would have had a fast shutter speed, but then only the heads would have been in focus. So depth of field, 7.1, my aperture. Then ISO, whatever it needs to be to... Um, to get to that shutter speed and that aperture. If in this particular case, if I felt that ISO 1600 was not enough, my, I, um, my shutter speed 1600 was not enough, my ISO, I could have put up even more. 1000, 1600, 2000, or if I decided I wanted more depth of field. If I decided I wanted to put this at like F10, remember more depth of field, the higher the F number, the lower your shutter speed will go. So let's say I put this at F10, 
all of a sudden my shutter speed went to 800. Probably would have still been a focus, but I wanted to make sure that there's no movement anywhere in the frame. So then I pushed my ISO up to whatever it needs to be. The, I, don't, I don't have the right number. It, it could be 1,600, it could be 2,000. So you see how, what I mean by don't overthink ISO. ISO just has to fit in with your shutter speed and your aperture. Now, if like, let's just get back to the modes again while I enjoy aperture priorities. If I had to use my, um, uh, auto mode, it would have probably given me a fast enough shutter speed, but my depth of field might've been very, very shallow again, which means some of that zebra would have been out, out of focus. Okay, here's another case. So shutter speed, 800. Okay, so I want, a, I want a fast shutter speed to get the movement of those little cups. Because they're lying down, I don't need a shutter speed of like 3,200. So then you can manipulate your, your ISO. You can bring your ISO down a little bit to get less grain, because remember, they're not running now, so you don't need to go over the top with your shutter speed. Even here, if I was shooting at a, with a 400 mm lens, in this scenario, that rule of thumb of one over focal length would have worked. And, and then you get nice depth of field across your frame and your aperture fits in, I mean, your, your ISO fits in with any of that. Look at this particular scenario. What is my most important thing here? My depth of field. So I wanted like F9, at least F9. It could have probably even gone to F10. So I dialed in F9, F10. Say I was at 200 ISO. Now I see, oh goodness, my shutter speed is only at like 320. ISO goes up until I see, okay, now my shutter speed is fine. I'm happy I've got my depth of field. Now I can start firing. Okay. Guys, please don't overthink ISO. The first thing that you should think of in a particular scene is my shutter speed. What should my shutter speed be? Do I want to freeze the action or do I want to blur it? Second thing is, what is my depth of field? Do I want to isolate my subject from the background? So then I would go a shallow depth of field. If I want to include more depth of field, put the number, your F number up. ISO, that has to fit in. If my, if my shutter speed is still, if I want an F10 and my shutter speed is still too slow, push your ISO to whatever it needs to be. In this particular case, yeah, I would have pushed my ISO up to like 3,200 if I had to. Okay, you get a little bit of grain, but it's not the end of the world, guys. People are really, really overthink it. Okay, it also comes down to um, getting your camera settings ready before moment happens. So in this particular case, we were in the Masamara, we had this young leopard who had a kill at the bottom of the tree. So we knew that he was gonna go up, take the kill up the tree. Okay, so what are the two things you need to get a leopard going up a tree. First thing, I want the fast shutter speed. If you've seen a leopard go up a tree, it happens very, very quickly. So I want the shutter speed of at least 1,600, maybe even 2,000, so I can freeze that movement. So that is my first thing that I want to get to. Then my aperture. I don't want to go down to 2.8 because remember, he's going to go up the tree. So my room for error is going to be very small than if I go 2.8. So I want to have a bit of depth in my image. So maybe like 7.1, so I can get the whole thing in focus. So I, I dial in 7.1, I have a look. What's my shutter speed? Oh, it's at 400. Okay, push my ISO up to, let's say 800. What's my shutter speed? It's maybe a thousand. Still not enough. Push my ISO up a bit more. Okay, now I've got a shutter speed of 2000. Happy days. Now I'm ready to take that shot. Okay. There you go. Shutter speed, 2000, aperture 7.1, ISO 1000. Okay, again, female, like a lioness coming through. Good chance she's gonna jump over the water, right? She's not gonna do it slowly. So I want the fast shutter speed to freeze that moment. Otherwise, if my shutter speed is too slow, it's gonna be blurred and I'm gonna be hating myself. Other thing is I want depth of field because I want that whole tail, everything in focus. My ISO fits in to whatever it needs to to get to those two scenes. And there I've got it. 3,200 shutter speed, that freezes the moment. F7.1, ISO 1,000. Whether my ISO was at 800 or 1,000 or 1,250, much of a muchness. It really, really doesn't matter too much. 
Does that make sense, guys? I think also, you know, if we something to remember as well is, you know, if you if you with a particular scene, if if you have something like this, or you know, maybe something more to that degree, when you're getting ready for the shot, you know, if it's afternoon and the sun starts dropping, your shutter speed will also drop. So your eyes also need to go up. So easy way to remember. When your sun comes up, ISO goes down, sun goes down, ISO goes up. But it all revolves around your shutter speed. I hope that I hope that helps. I hope that helps, guys. That's um yeah, I mean I think the, the biggest thing is to make sure you've got a fast shutter speed and then to check your aperture to and there's with aperture there's no right or wrong. We could be sitting four people in a vehicle. You might want to blur your background. I might want to include the background. There's nothing wrong with that, as long as you understand what it like the effect that you'll get from it. Okay, I mean, there's a few questions here which I'm going to um, have a look at. Um, so you've asked um, how you how, how do you know what's your camera's usable ISO? So UV that just goes just give it a practice. So you'll see like noise and like I mentioned, a lot of people overthink it way too much um, is it, it usually shows in your, in your dark areas of your frame. So go out, take your, take your camera out this evening, shoot at 1,600 ISO, shoot at 3,200, shoot at 6,400. Depends what camera it is. I think the, with the latest, latest cameras with the Sony's, they shoot ridiculous, like 12,800 ISO that is still usable. I think with the majority of the, the cameras now, I mean, I'm just talking Canon and Nikon, which I've been using most of, D5, 6,400 happy days, 1DX2, same. Um, so, you know what, for me personally, if, it, if it's an amazing scene, any ISO, as long as I get that shutter speed. The noise you can, you can deal with. You can't, you can't um, take an image that's completely out of focus and bring it back again. Uh, Yuri asked again, um, do you use auto ISO? Adele asked also auto ISO. Um, you can. So, so you, you can shoot um, in manual mode and then have your um, ISO auto and you can set limits. So you can set it at a minimum of 100 and then maximum of 6,400. You can do that as well. Yes, for sure. Um, personally, I haven't been doing it um, a lot. Uh, no, no real particular reason for that. I just it's, it's just become habit. And I think that's where also it becomes so key that you get to to know your cameras. You get to know where all the buttons are so you can change it very quickly. Um, but yeah, you can use auto ISO. That's um, definitely a, a way to do it. Let's have a look. Uh, right, see now, okay. Um, I don't know, leopard carrying a pangolin, very common sightings. Yeah, I tell you what, if, um, if, leopard, if I get a leopard carrying a pangolin, I'll put my ISO up to two and a half million if I have to. <laughs> Um, Grace, would you recommend auto ISO? Grace, um, yeah, for sure. I, I don't know if you've been shooting in, in manual. I know some of our guys do shoot in manual that you can then obviously set your shutter speed so you can make sure you've got a shutter speed of like a thousand. You can put your um, eyes, uh, your, your aperture to whatever you need and then you let your camera, um, you set your ISO so the, the camera bounces between 100 and then your maximum. So you can, you can maximize it at 6,400 if you wanted to, or 12,800. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's a great way to do it. I think the, the biggest thing I wanted to, to get to with this is, please don't overthink ISO. It really, really is, it, 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 that, that, it's that last little guy that makes everyone happy. Um, he makes your shutter speed aperture happy. He's gonna do whatever he has to, to get your, your image, okay? Um, Barbara, that was excellent, very helpful. Thank you. And thanks, Barbara. I hope you're well, man. Uh, great webinar. Thanks, Victor. Really appreciate it. Uh, Sally says, excellent, Johan. I always thought ISO was more important than shutter speed, but you have explained it so well. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sally. 100%. It is, um, it definitely is. ISO, people overthink it. I think it's because maybe it just sounds like a, a big word. ISO, I've got, what's your ISO? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. We're losing the plot, you see this uh, this whole um, lockdown thing. 
Yeah, all it is, like I said, the only downside is if you push your ISO up, you're gonna get a bit of noise, but it, uh, it's not the end of the world, not at all. Um, let's see what it is. Thank you so much for your guys' feedback. That is really nice. Um, it's so great to see all of you. <clears throat> and thanks, Shazman. Thanks, UV. Thanks, Bianca. You guys are amazing. <clears throat> I'm gonna have um, a few more, um, few more uh, minutes with some questions. Okay, so Brennan asks, can you please give a real life example of wildlife photography would made more sense to shoot manual over aperture or shutter and why? So Brendan, the only time I shoot manual uh, personally is if I do night photography, if I'm, if, if I'm doing like star trails, because then it just allows me to dial in my shutter speed that I want and I ignore um, what the camera's trying to do. So I usually then open the shutter up for 30 seconds. I can bring my aperture wide open, so low F number to be able to capture that Milky Way. You can also, like I mentioned now, you, you can also um, shoot in, in manual and then have your ISO run um, automatically. But I, I prefer to look through my viewfinder, keep an eye on my shutter speed and then get the desired aperture that I want and then man just manipulate my ISO to get that shutter speed, if that makes sense. Um, I hope, I hope that helps, Brendan. Um, how do you read light in a scene? Ado asks. Um, so, so this is the extra one. Um, maybe I'm, I'll do another webinar where I, where I include um, exposure compensation in it, because that that has a massive massive impact. But basically, you'll see if you if you're shooting in manual, you'll see there's a light meter that that moves at the bottom. That's basically your exposure. If you use, I don't know, I don't know what camera that you use, but um, send me an email if, if, if you're struggling with this. I've got a few blogs on it. It's a johan at wildeye.co.za. And I can help you. But basically, um, with uh, the, the big dial at your thumb with the cannons, if you move it to the left, it goes dark. If you move it to the right, it gets a little bit brighter. Only way to do that or to, to see is to, um, to take a photo, have a look at your exposure, and then adjust it accordingly. Um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, I'll maybe uh, let me know what you guys think. If you, if you want me to do a little bit uh, of a longer one where I bring exposure compensation into that. Okay, so I do you use a um, 7D Mark II. That's great. So if, you, if you're in, in um, aperture priority in AV, half press your shutter and then look through your viewfinder and then that big wheel where your, your thumb is. Half press your shutter and then dial that wheel to the left you'll see it will go one dot, another dot, and then a number one. So we call those thirds. So third, two thirds, one full stop. So right is bright, left is dark. Okay, so if you leave it on zero, take a photo. If you move it to the left, you'll see your image will become darker, but it'll also give you a faster shutter speed as well. Okay. Guys, I hope that helps. I'm gonna call it now. Um, I think there's been some, some great questions. And once again, thank you so much for all of you for taking the time to, um, to listen to this. It, uh, it really means a lot. And um, yeah, you guys are amazing. Stay safe. Um, keep practicing out there. And please, if you have any questions regarding this, if you have a few examples that you want to send my way, send them through. I'm happy to, happy to have a look at them. Johan at wildeye.co.za. So next time I've got another webinar coming up on Thursday, which I'll be sharing a safe mode when it comes to wildlife photography. That's also going to be quite a, a cool one to, to look out for. If you, if you haven't registered, make sure you tune in for that one. See you guys on Thursday. Keep well. Cheers.